somebody say bless 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 somebody say bless 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 somebody say bless 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 somebody say bless bless since i was walked up brightly as a light in a dark land since i was placed in And cast thy enemies away He's standing up within thee So let me hear you say We're blessed in the city We're blessed in the field We're blessed when we come and when we go We cast down every stronghold Sickness and poverty must cease For the devil is defeated We are blessed Somebody say blessed confidence in man everything that does concern thee you placed it in his hand the host rise up against thee to try and spoil the day the Russian one rode to harm thee but they'll flee seven ways we're blessed in the city we're blessed in the people we're blessed when we come and when we go The devil is defeated. We are blessed. We know that God's word is clothed in truth and righteousness. We are his children, and with our hearts we do confess. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed. The field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must cease. For the devil is defeated. We are led in the midnight. Late in the midnight, oh my God, God's gonna turn it around. He's gonna work in your favor. Amen. Late in the midnight. Late in this morning and late in the midnight hour my God he'll turn it around hallelujah Grace, oh, I need it. I 
my breath away. You take my breath away. Whoa. You take my breath away. You take my breath away.
call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me It's who you are, oh, I'm loved, I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way made, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I 
Hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Let me tell you something. God made a promise to Moses. He made a promise to Israel. He says, I'm going to bring you up out of the land of Egypt. And I'm going to bring you back to this mountain to worship me. And I'm going to bring you into a place called the promised land. And you know the story of all that God went through and he brought them out. They end up by the Red Sea. They got an ocean behind them. They got the most powerful army in the world coming down on them. And what did God do? He threw up a pillar of fire. It says it was darkness to Egypt and it was light to Israel. He was a light in the darkness. And then he turned around and he performed a miracle. You know what a miracle is? It's when God intervenes in the natural order of things. And he divided the Red Sea. How many of you know water is not supposed to stand divided? He was a miracle worker. And then he turned around and he dried the bottom of the ocean so they could go across on dry ground. He was a way maker. And he brought them to the other side and he was a promise keeper. And here's the word that God has for us today. I tell you what, that coronavirus, it don't matter. I got news for you. God's got a calling upon your life, upon this church, upon your family. It doesn't matter if there's riots in the street. It doesn't matter if this nation is divided. It doesn't matter what's going on. I'm here to tell you that he is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He is a light in the darkness. He is a promise keeper. And he is not done with you yet. Come on, let's do that one more time. Come on. You are way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Come on, he's the way maker. Way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise in this place. Wow. You may be seated if you can. Amen. I tell you, it's hard to move on at a time like this, but God's got a word for us today, church. We're not done yet. He's not done yet. He's always working. Amen. 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 Tina, throw my prayer up there on the screen for just a moment. All right, here we go. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I cannot change what's going on with the coronavirus. I cannot change what's going on politically right now. I cannot change those things. Amen? Only God can do that, and I'm going to let Him be in control. Can I get an amen? All right, the wisdom to know what we can do to protect our people. In the midst of it, as we move forward... We need wisdom that is there for God, to ask for God. By the way, all the children are ready to go now. I'm so excited, I about forgot to release the children. All the children are ready to go on down to the Adventure Center. Adventure Center. The Adventures of Faith. Amen. Youth, Doug is back there waiting on you. Man, isn't it great to see these young people back at church again. Amen. Amen. So what can we do to protect our people? Well, we've done so much, I don't want to go over everything, but this week what we've done is we brought in more chairs. I think we brought in about 50 chairs. We rearranged this area over here. I don't know if you've noticed, but it is much larger than it was before. We've also put in a new row along the back back there. All right, the front rows are empty, so we have some room in here, amen, that you can spread out to do social distancing because social distancing does work. It has been proven, amen. A good rule of thumb is, at first we said, you know, one family on each end of the row, if you keep three chairs between you, that's six feet, amen? Don't be afraid to sit down here on the front row, I promise you, I will not jump on you, amen? So just spread out, see, there's things that we can do, amen? It's not operating out of faith, I mean, out of fear, it's not operating with a lack of faith, it's just common sense, when we know what to do, we do. You know, I use the example I shared with you that Bill Estes sent me a a laboratory experiment that proves that masks work. I mean, they work. You just can't deny it if you look at it. Amen? So I'm talking about if you feel like you need to wear a mask, wear a mask. My little two-year-old grandson is sitting right here. Guess what? Whenever he gets in the car, my family's going to strap him in a car seat. You know why? Not because we're afraid. Not because we lack faith that God's watching over us. It's just common sense to protect him. Amen? Amen. So you feel like you need to wear a mask, wear a mask. Be considerate of other people. We've done things like we don't pass around the plate anymore. 
We have two baskets at the back of the sanctuary. We don't even ask you to go at one time so you don't crowd up. Anytime you want to make an offering, just go to either one of those tables and you do that. We have hand sanitizer. Someone said, man, I forgot and shook a bunch of hands. I had no problem. Go back there put a little hand sanitizer on. Amen? So we do things to protect our people. Amen? Uh, starting next month, the children will be checking in down at the Adventures of Faith and at the Youth House, and that will even give us a little more room in here. Amen? So what can we do? The wisdom that we know that we, we can do to protect our people, and here we go, this is what we're going to get into today, really, and the courage to trust you with the rest. As we continue to move forward, say move forward. As we continue to move forward by faith, for all authority has been given to you in heaven and on earth, so we are going therefore in Jesus' name, amen. So what are some of the ways that we're going therefore, that we're moving ahead? You know, right now, there's a huge problem that kids aren't back in school. I mean, I'm talking about, and it's a disaster, it really is. The first day of school, I don't know if you know this, but the whole Cobb County system crashed. They couldn't even go to school online the first day. Parents are having a nightmare. you got five Zoom calls trying to go at the same time. I mean, a lot of kids just don't learn that way. Amen? So I'm talking about it is a problem. Uh, I see people fanning. It gets a little warm in here because we have doors propped open and things. All those things are for safety. But here's the point. So what we're doing is we found out that in tax credit properties, it is especially an issue. A lot of those working single moms do not have Internet. That's just a bill they can't afford. They don't have... Uh, computers and things like that for each child. So we have a presence in five different um, tax credit properties. And so we, here at the church, down in Children's Church, if you want to throw up the first picture, Tina, we had a training going on where we trained 24 people to run learning labs. And so these are college graduates. And by the way, if you're a college graduate or you also uh, have ever been a, a tutor or teacher, we're still hiring. We still have room for about three more positions. It will not be full time. It'll be till, go ahead, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It will only be a job until school goes back. Amen. But the funding is there. We will be opening tomorrow morning with 94 students in that, in the learning lab. Also, we have our school here that is open. Amen. We only have 14 students down there. Now I'm talking about our teachers are making a huge sacrifice being there for 14 students. But you know, it's an amazing thing. We were already set up with cubicles with dividers between each child. That's what they're trying to do in the Cobb County schools right now. How many of you know that God goes before us? Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about our school was already prepared for this. So whether you know someone or you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube today, we got a great school. First Christian school in Cobb County is here at this church. And if you need a small, safe place for your children to go and learn that's very affordable, then you need to give us a call. We're one of the best kept secrets in Cobb County. Amen? Amen. We really, we could easily do 50 students, and then we could take care of our teachers and do everything that really that we need to do. See, here, the reason we can make it so affordable is that most churches want to make money off their schools. Our school will never pay rent. They'll never pay utilities. They're not, we're not looking to make money off our school. God is our source. We want to sow that back into the lives of teachers and students. Amen? Amen. Another thing that we're doing to move forward uh, is we have... Um, uh, the campus was actually full this week. It was a beautiful thing. There's a homeschool group. They're having a hard time finding somewhere to meet because they all come together. It's called Classical Conversations. Uh, it's what Philip and Amanda belong to, and the campus was full. We even had a class in the storage room this week down in Children's Church, and what was so funny, that was the one teacher said she just loved it and hoped they could come back. <laughs> Philip says, you do realize you're in the storage room. She says, I don't care. This is a great place. Amen? Amen. Amen. Another thing that we're doing is we're starting a, women, a ladies' class. As you know right now, at 930, we just have two adult classes. One here in the fellowship hall, one down with Lisa Webb down in the uh, building two first floor, only class on the floor, so plenty of social distancing room. On Tuesday mornings, we're going to be having a ladies class. It'll be starting, I believe it is September 8th. You want to go ahead and play that video for me, Tina? There's something beautiful about 
the body of Christ as women um, coming together and getting those needs met or discussed. Oftentimes our needs are not being met at a level which we can understand. And I think a women's Bible study, there is a sense of community, there's a sense of togetherness. Hi, I'm Beth Moore. I wanted to make a personal invitation to you to come be part of this Bible study, a 10-week study of the fruit of the Spirit called Living Beyond Yourself. And isn't that what we're challenged to do every single day? Those of us who are in Christ have been empowered through the Holy Spirit to live a life that is truly beyond us. You know, I had the privilege of writing this Bible study almost 10 years ago, but only recently we've come together to tape the video sessions to go along with it. God spoke a fresh word to us, and I don't want you to miss it. Please come along. I hope to see you there. Amen. Amen. So Janet and Una will be out in the foyer today so that you can register for that class. There is a, a, a fee of a book. It's $20. It'll be meeting, they'll be meeting on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock. Uh, if you don't have the money, if you're running tight, I've already had someone say, hey, I'd like to match five women that might need a little bit of help. They pay 10 and I'll pay 10 for their book. Amen? So believe me, if, and if you don't have any money, we will find a way. Amen? But the charge is $20. You need to register to this Sunday or next Sunday because we've got to have a little bit of time to be able to order those books. Amen? Well, with our youth, we have the youth house open again and so forth. We were not able to have youth camp this year. For the first time in how many years, uh, Alan? 59 years, the first time we were not able to have youth camp. And it's because it just wasn't safe. You couldn't take kids away to some little cabin. and I mean, just the transportation itself. But we are going to have a youth retreat that's not very far from here. It is going to be held at Banning Mills, owned by Mike and Donna um, Holder, who actually are part of the family that founded this church, the Holder family. I've been, Danny and I have stayed out there. We've had the widows go out there. Man, they got the best food in the world out there. Did you know they have the longest zip line in the world there? Guinness's World Book of Records has that sign up and so forth. Will you play me that video of what the youth are going to be doing? Okay, so what they're going to be doing is during fall break, they're going to leave here on a Monday. What you don't see on there is there's all kinds of pavilions and amphitheaters where you can do spiritual studies together. They have their own chef. I'm talking about some good cooking, amen. They'll be doing zip lining level two. There's four levels, so they're not on the first level, but we're not, of course, going to take them to the top level either, amen. But they are going to have a blast. They will spend all day Tuesday there, then they will be having a church service on that Wednesday morning and coming back. It's $150 a person for all of that. We realize that's a lot of money, so we're going to be having some fundraisers. The youth are going to have some adult guidance. We're going to have a big hot dog cookout where you can have to-go plates or eat in the gym. Hey, man, go ahead. I love hot dogs. You know, you may just want to make a donation. And what our goal is, is that those youth that participate in the fundraising, that, you know, who knows, maybe we'll raise enough money, it won't cost them anything. Or maybe we'll raise enough money so it costs them, you know, just a small fee, amen, to be able to go on that. So be praying about that. We'll be doing that cookout on Labor Day weekend. And uh, we'll actually have tickets out in the foyer next Sunday so we can start getting a count of how many plates you want. Personally, I want four. Two for Danny and I to eat while we're here, and two to take home with us. Amen? 
If they look real good, I might get six. Who knows? Amen. Amen. All right. Ready to get in the Word of God today? Amen. Woo, we got to hurry up, man. I'm telling you, we got to hurry up. I want to talk to you about something today. Well, as a matter of fact, I call, I'm going to call this message, Fear Not. Fear Not. Now, there's a good, healthy fear. It's called the fear of the Lord. As a matter of fact, the fear of the Lord is when I have a tremendous fear of doing anything that would interfere in my relationship with Him. It's actually rooted in love and respect, or love and reverence is where the fear of the Lord comes from. If you've ever read the book of Job, God said this. He said, told to Satan, He says, If you ever considered my servant Job, there's no one on earth like him. He fears God and he shuns evil. That's what the fear of the Lord does. It keeps you from ever walking into evil and from sinning because the reason and the motivation is not that you're scared God's going to beat you up or hurt you. You don't want to mess up what you got going on with God. As a matter of fact, Satan recognized it. You know what Satan said? He says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not hedged him about with protection? Have you not blessed everything that he, t- that he touches? That you've increased his possessions in the land? In other words, he recognized that the reason that Job did not had a fear of the Lord is he did not want anything to interfere in the wonderful relationship he had with him. Well, of course, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about that fear that comes out of 2 Timothy 1.7. That fear that is a spirit of fear. How many of you know that God has not given you a spirit of fear? But a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Amen? Amen. And see, Satan loves to use that spirit of fear. And listen, here's the thing you need to understand. There's something deeper going on. The fact is, is that the Holy Ghost is far more powerful than the devil. God is more powerful than the devil. Good is more powerful than evil. Light is more powerful than darkness. So the only way a spirit of fear can get on you is if there's something it can land upon. Fear that you already have from your flesh, and now the spirit of fear can come upon you. No, fear is something we need to talk about. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, I want to thank you today that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. And that is the only spirit we give a right to work in this place today, for we recognize that is the Holy Spirit of God. And we ask you to send him right now, the true teacher, to open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word. We're asking you right now, God, to give us the wisdom that we need to apply it, that when we walk out these doors, we'll be better prepared to live for you in these uncertain times than when we got here. And we thank you for that in the name of the only one who's ever made that possible. And that is in the name of your precious son, Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right, so once again, you don't want to confuse wisdom with fear. Amen? There is wisdom that if you know, if you don't look at it, or let me put it this way, that Satan can deceive you into thinking it's fear when really it's just wisdom being cautious. We're not going to put Noah in a car seat because we're scared. We're going to put Noah in a car seat because it's the wise thing to do. Amen? In no way do I believe anything's going to happen to them on their way home today. So I have faith they're going to be just fine. Okay. But what does, how does he use this? Remember, there's a biblical principle that you look at the natural to understand the spiritual. Amen? Have you ever been walking along and someone just jump out and go, Whoa! And you jump. Nobody touched you. There's no danger, but you reacted to something. Amen? Well, see, the same thing can happen in the spiritual realm. I'm talking about, man, listen, Satan can use that spirit of fear to come on you, and you will make decisions you would not have made without praying first, without taking anything into consideration. The worst financial decisions I've ever made investing was on a spirit of fear. All of a sudden, I got afraid. Okay, I'm talking about you. Is anybody here? Ever, is it only me or has anybody here ever made a decision based on fear? Uh, how'd it work out for you? Not too good, amen? Okay, and then there's an opposite reaction. Also, a spirit of fear can come upon you and you'll freeze. It'll paralyze you. In other words, God's saying, come on, and you're scared to go, amen? It's like if you're driving down the road and all of a sudden a car pulls out in front of you, you got the brakes, you can stop, but you freeze and just run right into that car. Like a deer in the headlights. Deer walks out at night, sees headlights, freezes. You ever seen deer in headlights? I'm talking about some folks live like that, amen? They become paralyzed, and right now people are being paralyzed by fear. There are people who are terrified to come out of their homes. 
I mean, I'm talking about anxiety medicine, medicines like Xanax and stuff are going through the roof. Drug overdoses are going through the roof. I'm talking about domestic violence is going through the roof. Why? Because people are paralyzed in fear and Satan is using it against them. I think one of the best known quotes uh, that I've ever heard that people uh, like to quote, and it's because there's truth in it, was actually made in 1933 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And here's what he said. He said, first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, what were they fearing? Well, the depression had just taken place. I'm talking about people were out of work. People were going hungry. You could see it with your eyes. See, you got to understand, back then they didn't have the technology we do now. If you took every person that's on food stamps right now and they had to stand in line to get a bowl of soup, it would change the whole atmosphere. Okay, I mean, they would see these things. There had been a pandemic that took out one-third of the world just 10 years before this. I mean, I'm talking about they were walking in a fear. Also, the world was beginning to stir up. It wasn't all happening at the same time. The world was beginning to stir up. Wars were breaking out in Europe. Pearl Harbor hadn't happened yet. But, you know, you could see the handwriting on the wall. Amen? And he says what we really have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Now, fear can be a healthy thing, like I said. But when it's unjustified terror, that's not a God. Amen? nameless and you say well now COVID has a name can I tell you it doesn't matter can I tell you Jesus's name is above every name I don't care what you name I don't care if you're talking about COVID you're talking about cancer you're talking about any, it doesn't matter I'm talking about his name is above every name amen but you know then with all that poverty it was just they were just afraid amen but here it is that unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. I mean, it's like what's happening in our nation today. We cannot shut this nation down. You know, they're, they're talking about it now that, you know, Biden's saying, if I get in, I'm going to shut everything down again. Man, I'm talking about, listen, in Europe right now, in Great Britain, they are talking about how the, the reaction to COVID is killing more people than COVID because people are afraid to go to the doctor. They don't want to go in the hospital and be in there by themselves. Isn't it terrible the loneliness that people are feeling in hospitals right now? They don't want to go. And so because of a lack of health care, because of drug addiction, they are now they, the death as a byproduct of COVID is more than COVID. And I would like to say that I believe you could say it's rooted in fear. You know, I was looking. You remember Desert Storm? Can you believe that was 30 years ago? You know, I'm sitting here thinking there's a lot of people in here that don't even remember that. It seemed like yesterday to me. And I can remember when Saddam Hussein shot like all these rockets at Israel. And I remember 48 of them, I believe it was, that got through. I was Googling it and researching it this week. And they showed pictures of them where these rockets were coming over and they were just flying apart. People were saying they were so poorly made they're flying apart. I'm going, no, I believe that's the God we serve right there. I'd only been saved a short time, but I had enough sense to realize that wasn't normal. And then they had pictures of Scud missiles 40 feet long just laying right in the middle of neighborhoods that didn't blow up. But some of them did. I think, you know, there's a lot of them that did. But they only had 13 deaths. Only one of those deaths was from an actual reaction or a direct impact of a missile. The other 12 were fear. Most of them were heart attacks. People had heart attacks because they were afraid of what might happen. Some of them were because of car wrecks. There was a couple of families that had an accident because one guy, he's so afraid of the missiles, he's looking up at something that wouldn't matter if you saw it or not, and he runs right into another family. It was a fear that killed 12, only the real enemy that killed one. I'm talking about this is something that we need to get our minds around, folks. Listen, I was uh, looking on uh, Facebook, and this popped up. I'm not sure who said it or who posted it. But it is so true. It says, fear does not stop death. It stops life. Fear does not stop death. It stops life. And worrying does not take away tomorrow's troubles. How many of you know that Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow? He says, you got enough to deal with today. Don't worry about tomorrow, right? 
Do you remember what he said? He said, which one of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Which one of you by worrying can live one hour longer? So you're wasting energy and you're stressing yourself out and you're damaging your health all at the same time over some unseen enemy. Worrying does not take away tomorrow's trouble. It takes away today's peace. Man, I'm talking about peace. Man, you got to have that peace. That is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? And if you can't have peace, then you better know a spirit of fear is coming upon you because that is the opposite of peace. Amen? I was thinking about, you know, it helps sometimes to get things into perspective. You know, if you look around at what the world's been through, in light of what we're going through, well, it's really not that bad, folks. I mean, it's really not. I mean, you think back to World War II, and I'm talking about they're bombing London. It was called the London Blitz. I mean, planes flying over. Look at that. Talk about moving forward. Little Riley. How old's Riley? One week old and here today? Two weeks old. Brand new member of OBT right there. Amen? Oh, my goodness. All right. So, going to distract me with the baby over there. Planes flying over. You can't see them. Clouds, you wouldn't even see them. You just hear them. Sirens going off. And bombs just raining. And you know, they made a simple sign that they put up all over London that you still see t-shirts with it on today. This is like 1930-something. And you still see it today. It's inspired over 900 slogans. I was Googling it this week. And it's simply this, this, this sign, keep calm and carry on. Keep calm and carry on. When the sirens are going off and the bombs are falling, you don't know whether an attack's going to happen today. You got to get out. You got to take care of your family. You got to do. Keep calm and carry on. I think it's kind of interesting. It has a crown there. How many of you know that corona is a Latin word for crown? It's kind of interesting there. Amen. Did you know that the slogan "Let go and let God" actually came from this? Yeah, I was reading up on that. In other words, instead of getting all excited and fearful, let go, keep calm. And instead of worrying about everything, let God carry on. Do your thing. Trust in Him. Amen? Amen. I think my favorite is, is keep calm. They won't be teenagers forever. (laughs) That's all that. That's pretty good. Amen? (laughs) But I was looking at pictures of the London Blitz, and I saw this picture that just really jumped out at me. Now, I, I just want you to see this. Okay, so... If you can see what's going on here, I mean, the smoke is still coming up. So this is not something that happened a long time ago, right? I mean, they're walking where bombs have just fallen. See this guy? I think he's smoking a cigar. But the one that gets me is this lady with a stroller. How would you like to be strolling your baby through that? Huh? How would you like to be walking with your child through that mess, not knowing when they were coming back? But here's what really got me, and I know you can't see it from there. You see where they're all headed to this group of people? You know what that is? It says church. Come on now, they're headed to the church bus. It says the church cantina. See, that's where the church is supposed to be. I'm talking about when 9-11 happened, what did you have? You had firemen run into the building while everybody else is running from it. Folks, this is what the church is supposed to be doing in times like this. I haven't had a hard time with coronavirus. I've had a hard time with the church's reaction to it. But i got to be careful because Philip preached on do not cast stones last week. But that's where we're supposed to be. Listen, if you go back and study church history, very often after a pandemic where, where Christians would go in and risk their lives, revival would break out. See, think about this. When those, when after 9-11... Whenever there's those pictures of all those firemen running towards those buildings, do you remember an empathy that everyone had for firemen after that? I mean, all of a sudden there was a renewed respect and reverence for that position. Well, after things like this, because of a church's reaction, the same thing would happen for the church. Revival would break out. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm really questioning, has the church lost an opportunity to have revival based on fear. Because for the most part, churches haven't reacted any different than anyone else. As a matter of fact, they were the first ones to retreat that I heard about on the news. Well, I got news for you. Keep calm 
Time to carry on. If they can walk through that, we can walk through this. Amen? And let me just say this. I've been meaning to say this for a while. You know, we never did close the church. We never did lock the doors of the church. And we just asked everyone to use their wisdom. You feel like you need to be home, be home. We'll be online. You can watch us online. You can't get too dependent on those cameras, though, because I got news for you. One day they're going to turn them off on us. I mean, if you can't see that handwriting on the wall, I don't know what to tell you. But so what we did is we kept the church open. Had people threaten to call the police on us. I told them, I said, listen, we got people that live right over here across the street. They can go to two liquor stores and a crack house in one block. Or the church, unless we close the doors. So I said, you tell the police that when they close down the liquor stores and the crack house, because I know they know it's there. I said, we might consider closing the church if you'll close them down. See, I knew they wouldn't do it, but I wasn't going to make any promises because I knew we weren't going to do it. Amen? But here's the point. I told our worship team, I said, look, guys, I don't want y'all to risk yourselves. You've got to follow the Lord through this thing. I said, you know, so if you don't want to come and do worship, that's fine. I'll just come in and preach. And not a one of our worship team backed off. Not one Sunday through the whole thing. Not only that, but I had a group of about 20 people. Elders and prayer people in our church, they didn't miss a single Sunday the whole time. They were here, even though we knew we wouldn't have 20 people in the sanctuary. We started having services in the parking lot, and Ed Miller goes, listen, I want to teach Sunday school. He says, there might be one person who'd want to come. You know, there's a lot of people who wouldn't do something for one person. But Ed was in there every single Sunday just in case somebody wanted to come. I told my staff, I told Doug, I mean, you know, Philip's got four children, Doug's got children. I said, you guys, you feel like you need to stay home, stay home. My staff never missed one day of work through the whole thing. And see, I've told y'all, if something bad ever really happened, let's say something were to happen and all of a sudden no cell phones were up, communications were down, banks were closed, I'll meet you right here. And those of us who make it here will get out of list and we'll start trying to get in touch with all y'all that didn't make it here to make sure you don't need anything. All right, let's talk about Jesus just a little bit. Amen? So Jesus, he's out teaching. He's teaching on the parable of the sower. He's teaching on the parable of the mustard seed. He's teaching on all these parables. And now he's about to start doing some lessons in life. Amen? In other words, now he's about to teach his disciples something by experience. So we come to Mark 4, 35 through 37 on the same day. The same day he was teaching on the parables. When evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm, say great windstorm. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. So it was a great windstorm. In other words, there was something different about this storm. I mean, I'm talking about, listen, it, can I just tell you there's something different about the storm that we're going through? Just like I said, we've had financial crises like in 2008. We had the H1N1 flu like back in 2010 or whatever it was. I mean, we've had riots in the street before, but we've never had all of them happening at the same time. The country has been divided before, but not like I see it today. It's like you can't even have a conversation with the two different mind thoughts. <coughs> and it's all happening at one time. We are in a strategic storm, folks, but I got news for you. It doesn't stop anything. Because I got news for you. Jesus' name is above every one of them. It doesn't matter if an army's coming down on you and a sea is at your back. I'm talking about God is a way maker. Amen? He is a miracle worker. He is a promise keeper. He is a light in the darkness. Amen? So what happens is they're out there in the middle of the ocean. Boats fill in the ocean. Sea of Galilee. It's a pretty big lake. That's why they call it a sea. It actually qualifies to be a sea instead of a, a lake or an ocean. It's in between. 
And, uh, you know, by faith, we are trusting we're going to Israel in March. We were supposed to be going in October. Right now, you can't get into Israel. If you go into Israel, you have to quarantine 14 days. We're only planning on staying there 10. Amen? But in the name of Jesus, by March, we will be out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and we will get a really good visual of this. Can I get an amen? amen. Mark 4, 38 through 40. But he was in the stern, speaking of Jesus, sleep on a pillow. So they're taking a nap. And they awoke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that people are getting sick? Do you not care that there's a coronavirus out there? Do you not care that there's riots in the street? Do you not? Absolutely he cares. But see, they don't trouble him. And I promise you, he's not afraid. And here's what happens next. Then he arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace be still. I got news for you. He could speak to that coronavirus and say, peace be still, just like that. And it'd be over. So why is it going on? Well, there's a purpose. There's a life lesson being learned. There's a whole lot of shaking going on to determine what's built on him and what's not. Danny and I just went to Myrtle Beach, and we're riding around, and I mean restaurants are closed everywhere. Every restaurant we went into was delicious. You know why? God shook out all the ones that weren't. <laughs> In other words, the only restaurants left were the ones that the locals knew were good, right? The ones the locals supported. So you didn't have to worry about it. You own a restaurant, it was good. They were happy to see you too. I'm talking about there's a whole lot of shaking going up. There's a reason why he hasn't rebuked it yet. But make no mistake, he can. Amen. And he will. Okay, but it doesn't mean we're not going to go through something else, so we better start learning how to walk through something. Amen? All right. He says, Peace be still, the wind ceased. There was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? So what if it's a great wind storm? So what if there's something different about this storm? So what? Don't you know who's in the boat with you? Don't you know who's in the boat beside you? Don't you know who's looking out over you? I'm talking about how is it that you have no faith? Why was he saying it? Because of all that you've seen God do, all that you've seen me do, how can you have so little faith? Well, time goes on, and I mean, you've got the, the example of the woman with an issue of blood who just comes up and touches Jesus' garment, and she's healed. You've got the example of Jesus raising someone from the dead. Then Jesus, after all that, he even sent them out two by two, to go before him. And he sends them out, and, and this is a life lesson. In other words, now you go out and do what you've been watching me do while I'm not physically with you. And so they go out, and sure enough, they've seen Jesus lay his hands on the sick. They lay their hands on the sick. People are healed. They've seen Jesus cast out demons. They cast out demons. Boy, they're getting all excited now, amen? I'm talking about they do everything that Jesus has done. So they come back, multitudes there. And now, I mean, there's some time passed here. Maybe a year or two has passed. And because they were with him for three years. So there's some time has passed. And he's out there and he's teaching and there's a multitude out there. So by the time we get to Mark chapter 6, it says this. It says, when the day was now, now not far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Aren't you concerned, Jesus? Don't you understand we're out in the wilderness? Don't you understand that there's nothing for people to eat? He says, send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. We've got a huge need here. Don't you care that we could perish out here, Jesus? Don't you need to go? I mean, have you ever tried to help God? I mean, God, don't you understand what's going on here? Yeah, he understands what's going on here, and he's not afraid. And so what does Jesus do? He answered and he said to them, you give them something to eat. You do it. You got everything you need. Go ahead, give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. There's no way we can feed all these people. He says, go ahead and have them all sit down on the ground. He says, go ahead and have them all sit down, put them in groups of 50. Now, listen, we're about to see that there's 5,000 men. 
Well, if there's 5,000 men, how many women were there? I mean, maybe there's 5,000 women. You know what I've noticed? Women chase the chase around Jesus, go to hear him more than men do. <laughs> men are so task-oriented, we often think we got other stuff to do. I mean, there's probably, I mean I'm just going to be truthful. There may have been more women than there were men out there. Well, how many kids did they have? In America, we have 2.5 children, so look forward to it. You got one and a half more to go over there, Jeff, in the morning. <laughs> I mean, there may have been 25,000 people out there. Amen? So here's what it says in verse 42 through 44. So they all ate and were filled. They didn't just eat and have enough to get by. They ate and they were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of the fish. Why did they have so much left over? Well, God has already promised us, if you'll trust him with your tithe, he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out our blessing that you can contain. Listen, right now we were offered unlimited 40-pound boxes of food. Okay, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, sometimes it's good to have a, pre, uh, a, a businessman in the White House. You can say whatever you want to say, but it's good to have a businessman in the White House sometimes. So you know what he did? All the farmers were going out of business. They were all hurting. But if you start running out of food, you want to see people get excited, run out of food. So he says, we're going to slap some tariffs on the Chinese. We're going to take that money. We're going to give it to the food banks, to the farmers. No, excuse me to the farmers with a condition they have to donate it to the food banks. There's so much food right now, we don't know what to do with all of it. We got 69,000 cartons of milk that's supposed to be drank by Wednesday. Okay, there's so much food, we don't know what to do with it all. Okay, I mean, if y'all want some 40-pound box of food, let us know. We'll have, we can even have them delivered here to the church. Okay, there's this, I mean, right now, nobody's going hungry. Let, let me let's share this with you. This comes out of um, the, the little daily bread that's out there. By the way, I put new ones out there for y'all today for the next quarter. And uh, this is from August 19th. I want y'all to get this. 300 children were dressed and seated for breakfast. And a prayer of thanks was offered for the food, but there was no food. This is in the 1800s. So get a picture. 300 children. They all sat down for breakfast, nothing to eat but they gave thanks like there was. And so it says, this was not an unusual for the orphanage director and missionary, George Mueller. Here was yet another opportunity. Not another disaster, not another crisis, another opportunity to see how God would provide. Within minutes of Mueller's prayer, a baker who couldn't sleep the night before showed up at the door, sensing that the orphanage could use the bread and he had made three batches and brought them to them. Not long afterwards, the town milkman appeared. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. He didn't want all of his milk to spoil and had to unload it, so he brought it all in case they needed it. Look, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter if you've got 300 people to feed. It doesn't matter if you've got 25,000 people to feed. It doesn't matter, of course, if you've got your family to feed. Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Listen to me. I, I, listen, if God told you to do something, I'm not saying just because you'd like to have it, but I'm talking about if you need it, it doesn't matter if it's a million dollars, if it's $10 million, it doesn't matter. I'm talking about God will provide. If you can take five loaves and two fish, feed thousands of people and have a bunch of leftovers, don't tell me that God's math only means two plus two equals four. God's math is just another zero on the end, amen? Why do they have 12 baskets left over? You know, I think, I mean, you don't really know. I always tell you when it's just my thought. But, you know, I can just see people going back to testify. People going, man, I don't believe that. You don't believe it? Here, have a bite. No, it ain't just fish. This fish is good. Oh, really? You should have been out there in the wilderness listening to what he had to say instead of sitting at home. That's what I believe it was for. Go back and testify. About the grace and the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. All right, so immediately after this, here's what happens next. Immediately. So, I mean immediately. What does he do? The same thing he did when he sent them out to do what he'd already shown them. Now he's about to give that lesson that we read about just a minute ago. He made his disciples. They didn't decide to. He says, you get in those boats. Get into the boat and go before him to the other side. In other words, he's not going to be with them this time. He's going to let them go out there on their own. 
to Bethesda while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now, a storm's about to come up, and so i got a question for you. Did Jesus know these storms were going to come up? Did Jesus know the first great storm was going to come up? I'm talking about you have a hard time convincing me that an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God ever been caught by surprise by anything. And where does he go? He goes up on the mountain to pray. Now, if you've ever been there, you've got to understand it's not like mountains we have here. It's just a grassy hill referred to as the Golan Heights. So he's sitting up there. He can see everything out there on the Sea of Galilee. Listen, all right, right now, if you've been looking at any weather patterns, have you seen where there's two tropical storms headed for the Gulf? Do you know why we can see that coming? Because we got satellites way up there. Can I tell you, God's way above that. Yeah. He can see what's coming. He hadn't been taken by surprise by anything that's happened. Okay, he can see what's coming, amen? So he's up on the mountain. I can't get a picture of him doing any. There's no way I can get a picture of Jesus going up there and looking another way. I got news for you. He's looking at you right now. He's looking over you right now. And I mean, listen, I don't ever want to belittle people's pain that, that loved ones have gone on to be with the Lord. I don't care if they were 99 years old and died of COVID. I, I don't mean belittle anybody's pain, but I got news for you. God's watching over you. I promise he sees everything that's coming. If your company's in trouble, he knows coming, and he'll have another thing open for you right behind it. Amen? I'm telling you, he sees what's coming. All right, so here's what happens next. Now, when evening came, verses 47 through 48, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining and rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, isn't that interesting? That's between 3 and 6 a.m. I mean, you ever felt like, God, where are you? You're running late. Don't you know they're out there going, man, I wish Jesus was asleep in the front of the boat. Well, it doesn't matter whether he's right there with you physically or not. He's looking out for you. And that's what he wanted them to learn. How are you going to deal with this storm? And I love this next part. You know what it says? And he came to them walking on the sea, and he would have passed them by. Do you ever imagine what things look like? I mean, I can almost see Jesus whistling. Oh, I can't whistle. But just whistling along, he's walking by going, what you going to do, boys? You already know what to do. You saw me lay hands on the sick, you did it, and it worked. You see me cast out demons, you did it, and it worked. Okay, you seen me say, peace be still, and it worked. What you going to do, boys? Just wonder what you going to do. Well, that's the picture I get in my mind. He's just going to pass them by. Why? Because he knew they would be okay. Jesus doesn't pass you by if you're not going to be okay. And it says he would have passed them by. Don't worry, we're about to come in for a landing. And it goes on to say this. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. And they cried out. They screamed. For they all saw him and were troubled. What does that mean? They were terrified. But immediately he talked to them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Say, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Say, I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. Next verses. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. Well, there's a deeper lesson. He didn't even have to say anything. He didn't have to say anything. The wind just ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. What did they not understand about the loaves? See, it's the same thing about the storm. The size of anything does not matter. We have a tendency to think like that. Oh, God can take care of this little thing, but oh no. God can take care of something I can see, but he can't take care of something I can't see. No, they didn't understand that God meets your needs no matter what they are. That God does care that you're perishing or you feel like you are. Because if you know Him, you're not ever going to perish. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right, we're coming in for landing. I want my worship team to come up here because... I want you guys in place in just a minute because there's, there's a part of this I want to make sure that you guys hear. Now, here's what's happening. You've got King Jehoshaphat, and the nation is divided. I mean, it's severely divided. He's a tribe of Judah. 
He's a king, so he's the tribe of Judah. And the only other tribe that they had there was the tribe of Levi, for they were the priests. The other ten tribes had gone on and gotten into all kinds of stuff they shouldn't get into. And there's about three nations coming against him. It is an overwhelming multitude coming against him. But the kings are there and the priests are there. How many of you know that you're a royal priesthood? Come on now. And he doesn't know what to do. And so I want to show you how they reacted. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 12 through 13. Here is Jehoshaphat. He says, oh our God, will you not judge them? Will you not do something to stop that? That that does not seem like that's you. Won't you do something to stop that? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us. In other words, we need to have peace to accept the fact we don't have the power, but that doesn't mean God doesn't. Nor do we know what to do. We don't know what to do. Aren't you glad that wisdom is there for the asking? James 1.5 says, if you're just asking for wisdom, he'll give it generously without finding fault. He says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you, and I really want you to get this next part. Okay? Does this something that needs to be up here? Okay, good. I'll kick it back under here again. So, <laughs> I want you to get this. So now all Judah, with their little ones, that means with their babies... We know they're not talking about children because they're about to mention that. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. That means that when there was an overwhelming enemy that they knew they had no power over, the wives, the husbands, the children, the babies, to stand before the Lord means they went to the temple. So that's why the Jews stand now with their noses up against the wailing wall. They stand, that's to them, that's standing before the Lord. They went to church. They didn't run from church. And they certainly didn't shut down the church. Come on now. So what happens is, is they're all out there. And then the Spirit of the Lord comes upon this priest named Jehaziel. And he says this in verse 15. He says, listen, all of you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you. See, it was up to the priest to represent the Lord the king had authority on earth. So that's why you had like David and Samuel working together. You had two different offices. But now we have both church. We are a royal priesthood. Remember in our prayer and the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So now you go therefore. You don't have to have me physically with you. You go and do what I've shown you that you can do. Amen? Now look at this. He tells him, he says, you, O King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, nor dismayed. You know what that means? Confused, scared, making crazy decisions, moving too fast or moving too slow. Don't be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Listen, one of the greatest challenges we have is understanding what our place is. Okay, what is it that God has called us to do and the rest is up to Him? God has called the prayer team to pray for your healing. The rest is up to Him. God has called the prayer team to agree with you. When any two agree is touching anything on earth is done by Father in heaven. Why? Because He's given us the keys of the kingdom. Don't keep the keys in your pocket. Okay, we can turn, it's our us to turn the key. It's up to Him to perform. God told me a long time ago, don't worry about filling up the church, just fill the pulpit. That's all I want you to do is just get up there, don't compromise, fill the pulpit. I'll take care of everything else. So I don't care how big it gets, how small it gets, whatever it gets, that's his part. We all got to figure out what is our part in this thing. All right, now here it gets. All y'all hear me back there? Can you hear me in there, Jake? Can you hear me in there? All right, here we go. Stand to your feet if you can, if it's comfortable for you. 2 Chronicles 20, 21 says this. And when he, speaking of King Jehoshaphat, had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. Now I'm talking about catastrophes coming. I mean, there's a multitude we can't do anything about. How are you supposed to react? Sing. 
to the Lord. Now listen. And who should praise the beauty of His holiness? Now listen, if you're out beyond holiness and you're out there just running wild, you need to come on back to the beauty of holiness because, you know, God will let you get out there on your own. Because don't do that. But listen to this. He appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of His holiness as they went out before the army. And they were saying, Praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. They got an overwhelming enemy coming and they send the choir out first. And do you know what happens? All those enemies turned on each other. They all turned on each other, attacked each other, and they just walked in and picked up the spoil. With that in mind, let's worship together. This is how I fight my battle. 
This is how I fight my 